Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of Business and Program Development at the Milken Institute, Katie O'Reilly. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction and the warm welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to our lunch program today. We have a two-part program for you. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So we're rounding out our second annual MENA Summit. We've been thrilled to have so many leaders from around the region and actually around the world here talking about so many important issues. And we thank all of you for being with us for the second year in a row. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about why we do these events. I was asked about it a number of times since we've been here. Many of you know us. We convene events all around the world, the US, Asia, and Europe. Um, and we do it with the intent always of creating new ideas and new relationships. That's, that's part of the magic, hopefully, of the events that we do, but always with the intent to advance real solutions. And that's why we, we know all of that advancing policy change and economic change takes a lot more than just conversation. So that's why we have year, our work happening year round at the Institute on, on substantive content in a variety of different areas. And I would encourage all of you to read more about that on our website. So all of that's important, but we know that change doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so that's why we're here having these conversations. We want to hold people accountable. We want to hopefully generate new thoughts and ideas among people having conversation and dialogue. And so that's a big part of our mission and why, why we're always doing that. So, and we would not be able to do that without the financial and intellectual commitment of our sponsors. So please join me in thanking them. The Milken Institute wishes to thank our underwriter, sponsors, and strategic partners for their support. Without their generosity, our work at the MENA Summit would not be possible. Our underwriter, KBBO Group. Our MENA Summit sponsors, APQ Global Limited, Bearings, Bombardier Business Aircraft, City. Bahrain Economic Development Board, Etihad Airways, Fitch Ratings, Golden Tree Asset Management, InvestCorp, SoftBank Investment Advisors, and our strategic partners, Amgen, Bearings, Bombardier Business Aircraft, City, Credit Ease. Credit Suisse, Bahrain Economic Development Board, EJF Capital, EY, Golden Tree Asset Management, Guggenheim Partners, The Helmsley Charitable Trust, Invest Corp, Jefferies, KBBO Group, PepsiCo, Principal Financial Group, The Chef and Sangreal Foundation, State Street, Varde Partners, Vista Equity Partners, WorldQuant. Thank you all. Thank you. And so for those of you who want to come around the world with us, we are hosting a Japan Symposium um, for the first time March 25th. And our annual global conference, which we've been doing for over 20 years, will be in Los Angeles April 27th through May 1st. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, the, for the first part of our lunch series, Hadley Gamble and Sean Parker. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hadley Gamble. I am CNBC's anchor and Middle East correspondent here in the region, based actually right here in Abu Dhabi. And it's my great privilege to uh, welcome you all once again to the Milken Institute MENA Summit Day 2. And shortly, you'll be able to enjoy your lunch. But before we get to that, uh, I am going to introduce a man that really needs no introduction, Mr. Sean Parker, to be in conversation today. We're going to be covering quite a few different areas, but one of which is your move into cancer research, your focus on that, and apparently you decided to do that over drinks with friends. So it all happened I, in a I bar. Did. Walk us through it. 
Okay, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who prepped you on this, <laughs> but um, in a bar over drinks with friends, um, a priest, a rabbi, and walked in. I, I don't. So, so um, I'm not sure that actually happened. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to pivot off of that and make this as entertaining as possible, despite the fact that we're talking about a subject like cancer that affects, um, affects everyone, if not directly, then one of their family members or close friends. Um, no, my move into cancer, unfortunately, did not take place in a bar over drinks with friends. It took place because um, a lot of my dear friends had... Um, were afflicted by cancer and and died, you know, many of them far too young in, 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 in the in the prime of their career, and I I had been thinking a lot about about just the problems of the medical system in general, the the, the issues plaguing um, medical research and regulatory, and why is it taking so long to get drugs approved, and the, wh why is it that you know the, there's such an incredible gap between what's possible scientifically and what actually gets to market as a drug. Where, what's wrong, where's that valley of death? What creates it? Why, why can't we, and why can't we tackle this thing? We can cure 50% of all cancers with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Targeted therapy was supposed to be the solution. My, Matt, changing, understanding the oncogenes that drive cancer was supposed to be the solution, and yet, and yet we've made um, basically no progress in the last 20 years with a few notable exceptions. Um, I was very interested in the immune system, and I was very interested in the field of immunology as a whole and the relationship between the immune system and cancer. And I had, I had an insight that's going to sound a little bit esoteric, so bear with me. This will get more interesting as time goes on. Don't worry. Um, but the, the, you know, if you think about it, everybody's got T cells in your body. They're, the, they're a form of white cell. Uh, they are the cells that are infected by HIV. That's why when uh, HIV develops into AIDS, uh, you can no longer fight off infections. They're the single most important immune cell in your body. Um, and T cells are really good. They're like little supercomputers. They're incredibly good at distinguishing um, healthy normal cells from unhealthy cells that have been infected by viruses. So why shouldn't they be able to see highly mutated cancer cells, which in some cases are much more mutated than a cell that's uh, infected by a virus. Those are, those are, you know, if you get the cold, if you, if, you, if you come down with a coronavirus, which is the common cold, or rhinovirus, and it's infecting your nose, and you're sneezing, and you're coughing, and so forth, um, those cells are basically still nose cells. They're called epithelial cells. And they, and they unfortunately are moonlighting as little virus production factories, but the fact that they, they have some weird proteins on their surface allows T cells to see them and kill them, even though they belong to you. So if they can do that, why the, why the heck can't they um, do anything about cancer? Well, it turns out they do. Turns out all the time, everyone's developing the beginnings of cancer, the immune system is flushing those cells out, and it's not until those cells develop the ability to evade the immune system that, that you, know, you end up with a metastatic tumor. So realizing all of this, I decided to start putting a lot of my philanthropic dollars into some researchers who turned out to be pretty important, a guy named Dr. Jim Allison, who now heads our uh, cancer center at MD Anderson and just won the Nobel Prize in December. Uh, a guy named Carl June, Dr. Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania, who created the first um, T cell therapy, um, and a variety of other interesting people. We, in, I've, I've, I say invested, but I've donated for my foundation some, somewhere, somewhere in the order of 400 million over the last uh, decade t towards building an institute for cancer immunotherapy and trying to accelerate um, progress in, the, in, the, in that field. And when you look at what's going to be the next big Where thing. Where did you get the bar thing? <laughs> <laughs> when you get the next, when you look at what's going to be the next big thing, you put a lot of your own money into this. You see who's doing it right, who's doing it wrong in terms of the investment case for healthcare. What's the next big thing? So, so I, you know, my, as an investor, I was, I was always a very contrarian investor. I, 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 I never really believed in the, in the prevailing narrative. So in 1999, the internet was booming. By 2001, there was a complete bust. All of those companies were wiped off the face of the earth, and nobody would fund companies in the consumer internet. It was like it was never going to happen again. Um, and that turned out to be completely wrong. 
Um, and luckily, I never believed it. So I, I, I continued you know, pursuing various things in social media. I ended up um, meeting Mark Zuckerberg. The two of us, along with Dustin Moskowitz, founded Facebook. I worked on product there for, for several years helped raise a lot of the money, came up with a lot of the early theories about how you build engagement on these platforms, and, and, and took something that was relatively fringe and made it relatively mainstream. Um, I can't take full credit for, for making, uh, taking immunotherapy from being fringe to mainstream, but certainly when I got into cancer treatment and life sciences, immunotherapy was considered on the outskirts, and, can, and, and, and most of the establishment, in particular the government agencies that, like NCI that are responsible for most funding of life sciences were not paying attention, so private philanthropy had to step in. In terms of investing, um, I think it's oh, you know, you know, I think this is not everyone's strategy, but but our strategy has always been to in, to look for underserved markets, to look for markets that are off the beaten path. Um, so, you know, to the extent that most of what you're hearing about is AI or blockchain. There's a reasonably good chance that those are not going to be the thematics that drive the 21st century. Um, they may be somewhat important, and there may be some applications that really matter. Um, and, and, but there may also be, there are, I can guarantee you, the only thing I can say with any certainty is the 21st century is not going to look the way futurists today think it's going to look. Um, we probably do not need to worry about uh, machines uh, merging with humanity in the next hundred years. I'd be more worried about a lot of other things like mass migrations due to climate change or something along those lines. I, I don't believe in the, you know, as much as I love Elon and, and he's a great entrepreneur and a friend, uh, his comic book vision of a future in, in which uh, an artificial superintelligence takes over everything and enslaves the human race is probably not what we should be worrying about. Um, what I, one of the things we, one of the things that's a, that genuinely we should worry about, and where there are problems, I see huge opportunities. And I and and I I think that you know in, in many cases a problem is not a problem at all. It 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 it's 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 simply an industry or a sector in need of innovation. So you look at, for instance, um, healthcare life sciences. We spend in the U.S. We spend 18 percent of GDP every year on healthcare. Now we're bearing a lot of the burden of developing drugs and stuff for the rest of the world, and we have a really messed up, like quasi-private-public healthcare system. But that's 3.5 trillion dollars a year. Like that's a crazy amount of of money. And the, if you believe the Congressional budge, Budget Office, by 2035, it's going to be 34%. And by 2080, if you can believe it, uh, projections show the U.S. spending 50% of all GDP on health care, medication, taking care of the population. The, something, something has to change here. And the, the good news is, the good news in all of this is that we're, we're on the cusp of a revolution in life sciences. Um, and it's being driven by, by, you know, sequencing the human genome was just the first step. We only, we, we, we barely know what any of these genes do. We know they code for proteins, we don't know what those proteins do, in, and, and they may do one thing in the brain. Um, adenis, adenosine or adenosine is a neurotransmitter and when you drink coffee you're drinking caffeine and it antagonizes that receptor and keeps you from falling asleep nobody would have expected that 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 um, uh, adenosine is also uh, one of the chemicals that cancer uses to prevent the immune system from attacking it it turns out it shuts down T cells so the com enormous complexity of, of human systems and biological systems is something that we're starting to untangle for the first time. Um, and it's not one technology, it's a huge suite of technologies that are, that are acting as catalysts. And that is the perfect time to get into a market. Like if you think about semiconductors, semiconductor companies were really valuable, but what the things that semiconductors created, telecommunications, the internet, personal computing, cell phones, you know, more 
addic you know, addiction to social media, you know, um, on and on and on, it, it are all byproducts of the fact that Moore's Law kicked in and semiconductors got smaller. You got, you got more processor power for less money every 18 months. The same thing is happening in life sciences, where you're getting more you're getting more innovation faster. And now I talk to postdocs all the time at UCSF um, who tell me that their grad students can do the work of a scientist who spent 30 years of their career discovering a single protein and its function. They can do all of that work in one day. And it, it, this is not because of gene sequencing. This is because of a whole bunch of catalytic innovations that are coming together at the same time. So you're saying that essentially when AI technology, not necessarily thing, the thing that's going to be the next big thing, when you're looking to find some kind of growth in a declining market, we've seen so much volatility in tech stocks. Where are we headed? Where are you looking? Well, I, I think we should be looking at a world of volatility across the board. You know, we're, we're probably entering in, in one of the most volatile, certainly the last year of the stock market, we've seen this, but we're entering a period of extraordinary volatility. And if pension funds and large institutional investors lose faith in the public equities market, we are going to be in a very interesting situation where these, you know, if you're a large pension and, and you're, you know, you're, trying to, you're trying to make your 10 or 15% a year that you need to make in order to, in order to, in order to meet your obligations, where do you go for growth? Where are you going to find growth in a future where people don't necessarily believe in public equities to the degree that they have over the last decade? And, and the answer to this is the same answer it's always been for the last 150 years, and that's technology. So the, the, you know, some of those technologies are going to be things like content. I mean, we went through the last 10 years, it was all about platforms, Netflix, Facebook, Snapchat, platform companies, Airbnb, platform company. Now you're seeing the resurgence of content. Netflix and its competitors are literally going to spend $16 billion a year, going to $20 plus billion a year um, over the next five years, just buying content. And you can argue well, they're buying a lot of junk, but they're also making some really amazing content. The total spend of the legacy movie studios is only $4 billion a year. That's a, that's a massive change that, that investors should be, should be taking, paying attention to. Cyber warfare, whether it's state actors or non-state actors, that's a, that's a huge problem. And on the flip side, there's a huge opportunity in cyber defense. So that's a thematic we should be paying attention to. But the biggest one that I think dwarfs them all is life sciences. Because if, we, if we're going to be spending 50% of GDP, if that's where 50% of our spending is, I want to be the person selling as an investor. I want to be the person that's benefiting from that spending. Um, so does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> So of the Stanford panels that I've done in the last three days, the majority of them have focused on healthcare. They've focused on mental health. They've focused on uh, looking at how data can make our lives better um, and how collating that data can actually give us a clue as to what's going to happen next. One of the things that I spoke with Ariana Huffington, a dear friend of mine over the last couple of days about, was our addiction to social media. And she's always telling me, take off your heels and put your phone down. Get away from your phone. Because how many conversations do you have at a forum like this one where literally this is all you see? The question I have for you is, given um, your involvement in Facebook as a founding member, do you have any regrets about this monster that you've created? I love it when I get this question. This is, um, th there's always a point in the interview that goes in this direction. Um, <laughs> Hate to be a foregone I, I do want to talk about CRISPR for a minute, but we'll, we, we'll, so we, we can be, uh, I'll be brief on this one. I don't have any particular regrets because n I could have never understood the consequences of what we built when it reached population scale. I've never, I mean, very few people get a chance to build something that reaches population scale. Um, and, 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 and not just in one country, but like across the world. Uh, two billion users makes uh, me the representative of effectively the largest country in the, in, in the world. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I get, I'm very concerned about 
something that we put in place very early, which is, which is this uh, comes from an understanding of, of human psychology and the need for social validation, the need for feedback from your friends. We understood this intuitively, then we, we made it explicit in our product design. And the idea being that if, if we're a content company but we're relying on you to give us content, we need to give you feedback. We need to give you a little dopamine hit every time you post content. In fact, if we want to keep you coming back to the product, we need to be giving you a little dopamine hit every, you know, as frequently as we can. And when the product was on the desktop, that was fine. You would only spend a couple hours a day on Facebook, which seemed like a lot. Um, but when mobile happened, and mobile phones, the iPhone in particular, when that became ubiquitous, suddenly the feedback loop got tighter and tighter and tighter to where you, could, you were constantly getting feedback. You've posted content. You're getting likes and comments on that content. We're getting better and better at figuring out which of your friends are going to like and comment. So your content is actually getting routed and showing up on the feeds of the people who are more likely to like and comment. Um, and so we're increasing the amount of social validation or feedback that you're getting, and, that's, and that feedback loop is getting tighter and you're getting more addicted. So the product was designed to be addictive, but it was designed to be addictive in a world where, um, you know, people you People had you, something else going on. And you were only allowed to do drugs in your bedroom at home. <laughs> you know, it, it, now, now it's sort of pervasive. It's, 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 it's every, you're, you're taking it with you everywhere. At the end of the day, though, there are serious <laughs> concerns about privacy. You mentioned cyber warfare. There's a serious concern right now about the ability of social platforms um, to influence people, how they vote, how they actually think. And that's something that's becoming increasingly concerning, really, for voters in the United States and certainly on Capitol Hill. But you have hearings in which Mark Zuckerberg is being questioned by 80-something-plus-year-old senators who don't know the difference between their email and their WhatsApp. Do you believe it's a, at a point where the Department of Justice is going to have to get involved? I mean, on the, on the privacy front, it, 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 uh, you, you know, you're opting in. You're choosing to, to disclose your private information. And I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to just kind of pivot off of Facebook. It's gonna, it'll come across that way. But, but I, I worry more about companies like Amazon because they're, they're doing, you know, Facebook is something you use actively. Instagram is something you use actively. You're, you're choosing to post content, and you understand that ads may be targeted based on the content you post and so forth. Um, Amazon Alexa, on the other hand, is listening to everything you say. E literally everything you say. You don't have to say, hey, Alexa. It's, uh, it's the micro, I mean, the, the, the microphone's on. And it's, it's recording, and if you need any evidence of this, just look at all the subpoenas uh, that Amazon has received from law enforcement agencies because there was a domestic violence dispute and Alexa recorded a husband and a wife screaming at each other. And that's out there. I mean, you're... You're, if you're having a conversation in front of an Alexa-enabled device, um, Amazon's not guaranteeing you any privacy. You, you, your conversation is, is being recorded, and Amazon happens to also own AWS, so they have more cloud storage than anybody in the world, and, they're, and they're gonna, you know, there's no limit to, to, how, to how, how much of your, your, what you believe are private conversations are being stored and could, be, could potentially be used against you in a court of law um, or for other purposes. So if the corporates are not going to police themselves, is it then the responsibility of the government to police them? It is, I mean, it's, a, it, it's ultimately against these companies' own financial interests to police themselves. Though you do have to wonder why Amazon, for instance, would try to extract the incremental benefit of listening to everything you say. I mean, it's a, it's a, th th that feels like a, just a bad business decision because as, once the public realizes that's happening, um, they probably won't buy Alexa devices. So, so ho hopefully, hopefully, you, you know, the public dialogue will, 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 have a, will, have a, will play a role here because if the, if the public dialogue doesn't change these companies' behavior, then to your point, you know, it becomes a government issue. Sean Parker, thanks so much for joining us. We didn't talk about uh, CRISPR, The Sputnik? Though. CRISPR, though. We, 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 we should talk about... Well, we have three minutes, so you can go right ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so the, you know, to, back to the point about life sciences, I mean, I think the, I think the thing that we're, we're, we're really missing um, as a society, Bill Gates tweeted out the other day that the number one public policy debate that we're not having um, is the implications of gene editing. So just, to, just last year, the most underreported story of the year was that a Chinese scientist um, named He uh, Zhang Ku, I think I may be mispronouncing his name, got up on stage and announced that he, had, that he had gene edited a set of twins. 
um, with minimal parental consent and then abruptly disappeared. It has not been heard from since. We don't really know where he is. We don't know if the Chinese, but it did confirm something that we should all be very worried about, which is that the Chinese have had secret programs, gene editing babies for a while. We've been doing this, we've been doing this you know, regularly in non-human animals. Um, and the consequences of it are, are unbelievable. Uh, if you think about all the hereditary diseases, which include severe debilitating diseases like, you know, muscular dystrophy or autoimmune diseases that are incredibly debilitating or, or uh, diseases that will result in severe forms of, of autism or birth defects, diseases that are going to cause your children potentially to have a, a you know, lead a life of, you know, just tremendous suffering and difficulty. And if, if you as a parent are told, based on a, a routine genetic test, that you're going to give birth to a child that is, that is going to suffer, um, you, you really have, you're going to have three options. One is give, you know, you, you know let, let the child be born and, and, and face the consequences. Terminate the preg pregnancy, which may not be allowable in some cultures, or simply, or simply make that gene edit. And I, I, I know we're in a, in a darkened room, but like, I, I'd love to see a show of hands, like if you're told that your child um, has a debilitating genetic d disease that will cause them to have a permanent handicap, would you be willing to, would, would you remove that gene edit? Because I, I would. No, nobody else would? And That's then okay. begs the question of superhumans. So then, then there's the question of, of, well, where do you go from there? Do you, if, you're, if you're told that your child is, is going to be, you know, your, your young boy is going to be like, you know, four foot five or have dwarfism or something, they could have a somewhat normal life, but it's not going to be ideal. How many people would choose to correct that genetic, genetic um, you could say defect or genetic, you know, that, uh, that particular characteristic? Where does this lead? So then are designer babies okay? Can you in increase the height of a child, change their hair color? And what happens if you're told your child is going to have behavioral problems and you start making gene edits that could affect their, their behavior, their, their attention span, their learning? Um, these are really deep moral and ethical questions that aren't, we're, we're, going to, we're going to have to face these questions in the next 10 or 20 years. And we're not having a conversation as a society about, about those questions. So the, the China, you mentioned Sputnik 2.0, the, uh, the China thing should serve as a warning to, to, to the rest of the world in the same way that Sputnik uh, was a, was a, was a wake-up call for the U.S. This is happening. The technology is incredibly easy. Scientists could be doing it. They're choosing not to for ethical reasons. But there's, you know, as we start to better understand which genes cause which, you know, severe diseases, we're going to have some really interesting moral decisions that, that we, we have to grapple with. Sean Parker, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all. Cool.